All right. All right. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> so this is a special episode of The Social Brain. We haven't done anything like this before. Uh, so we'll kind of see how it goes. But this is going to be kind of an Ask Us Anything uh, episode. Uh, we put out some uh, some notifications on both of our channels about what kind of questions all of you wanted us to answer. Uh, and we've been kind of pouring through those. We can't answer all of them. Some of them are pretty broad. Uh, and there's some that are really good questions that we're not going to get into today, but are it's because we're kind of saving them because they're like full episode type questions. Um, but I think an important thing to note here at the beginning is that we don't know everything. Uh, we're going to kind of tell you where our, our limitations are with these kind of things, but really try to answer these uh, as best we can for all of you. Yeah, definitely. We got so many good questions that it was like, we had to be selective on which ones we chose. And um, a lot of these are so good that like like Taylor said, we're gonna be uh, answering them to the best of our ability, but also explaining where uh, we we don't know. Um, but yeah, I guess we can just kind of jump right into it. And I guess before we do, um, if you guys have any other questions while you're listening or watching, mm -hmm. um, be sure to throw those in the chat and we'll try to get to those as well. Although. I don't know. No promises, just because we've got we got a lot of uh, <laughs> other questions from you all to answer here. So, um, so yeah, you want to uh, get into the first yeah. question, Taylor? And I think too, before we we really jump in, I just want to say thank you <laughs> to everybody. Uh, this is really cool how engaged the audience has been. Uh, when we thought to do this kind of an episode, we didn't think we'd get like dozens and dozens of questions. Uh, so this was this was really cool. And we we really enjoy doing this. We enjoy kind of having this community that we're building with all of you. So uh, I think that's a good good kind of segue into the first question, uh, which is really just about uh, someone asked about resources, uh, how they can learn about the brain kind of from the basics to, to really kind of get into the topic and to understand where the field's at with neuroscience. Um, and Andrew put together a really nice list for this question. I just want to say, starting out with this one, that David Eagleman is like my idol. <laughs> like he is really who who got me into, especially the cognitive neuro side of things. I originally was working in like rat labs and working with uh, like the, the molecular neuroscience side of things. But he really showed me how cool human neuroscience was. And he is a, a just fantastic writer. So he writes books that are really approachable for the general reader. Uh, he has one, I think that's just called The Brain. Uh, but uh, some of the, the newer ones, uh, I knew I was going to like blank as soon as I started doing this. Uh, what's the name Live of his wired. newest one? Livewire. Live fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. And then, uh, and I think Andrew just froze up on us a little bit. Uh, a really good place if you want to learn about the brain, uh, I created an entire cognitive neuroscience course. Uh, and that's how I got into YouTube originally, is that I had put this class together for an undergraduate uh, class that I was teaching at the university. And I had decided to Definitely. record. I would, I would say. Oh, <laughs> I think Andrew's coming back in. Um, but I had decided to record all of my lectures. And at the time, I decided to just put them all on YouTube and to put them out there to avoid all of these paywalls that everyone's around and everything. Uh, so if you really want a deep dive into human neuroscience, into what we know about the human brain, uh, deeper than we get into this show, uh, I have that entire course for free on my channel. So good place to start. Am I unfrozen? Yeah, you're unfrozen. I got you. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, to to uh, tag on to that, um, yeah, I think like I had some different categories to to approach this with, um, just depending on kind of how deep and and how rigorously you want to get into this stuff. Um, so the sometimes referred to as the Bible of the field is the um, textbook called Principles of Neural Science. And that is um, has multiple authors. One of them is Eric Kandel, who's um, Nobel Prize winner. And um, it's just really thorough overview of kind of every, almost every level of neuroscience. So that, that one you'd really, you want to be committed if you're going to pick up that book and start reading it. Um, but uh, I jump in it. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Eric Kandel, the author, the Nobel Prize winner, 
Uh, I read his biography, In Search of Memory. And if you want a history of neuroscience, of like tracking through like the, the 40s and 50s as we first started to like learn about the individual neurons and what they were doing, uh, he won Nobel Prizes for long-term potentiation for understanding like the neural mechanisms of memory. And his his book just tracking, like it gets into the fight of the, the sparks in the soups. Uh, the, I mean, this was less than 100 years ago. We were unsure whether it was electrical transmission or whether it was chemical transmission between neurons. And people were literally like fist fighting at conferences over whether <laughs> that was true. And it kind of goes through all that really cool history. So I just wanted to drop that in. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is good. And he is a really great writer. So um, mm -hmm. that will be uh, I'm sure that's good, too. Um, a, a one that I, I have always recommended to people and um, have uh, it, it's gotten a lot of accolades is this book uh, Behave by Robert Sapolsky. And uh, he really just goes through different levels of um, what sort of causes human behavior. And uh, it's kind of centered around this idea of the biology of humans at our best and worst. So um, there's sort of uh, kind of like almost an ethical, uh, uh, what am I, like motif <laughs> kind of going through it. But, um, but he goes from like, N neurons and then to hormones and to neurotransmitters and gives you a really good overview. This book was published, I think, in 2017. So it's still pretty recent. And um, he is also a really, really approachable writer, really nice. Um, it's uh, so that one, I would say overall, if you just want a good book about the brain and about human behavior, um, Behave by Robert Sapolsky. And he's a, um, he's a great speaker, too. If you mm -hmm. look up Robert Sapolsky on YouTube, he's got dozens of, uh, of like really approachable talks that he does on all these topics. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, a second one that um, is has also gotten a lot of um, like critical acclaim is this uh, Projections by Carl Dyseroth. And he's actually a neuropsychologist or uh, sorry, neuropsychiatrist, but also um, is one of the inventors of the field of optogenetics, uh, which is where they kind of genetically engineer neurons to have um, light sensitive ion channels in them so they can directly activate uh, brain regions or, or it really individual populations of neurons in um, in mice. But anyway, this book is actually just really nice read. It, it goes through, uh, he talks to different patients and he is, this, if you want a book that is just a real pleasure to read and you don't want to feel like you're having to memorize all these multi-syllabic <laughs> brain region, Latin names and all that stuff, that book is, is really good. Um, I will admit that I teared up multiple times while reading that book. It's just a very, <laughs> very nicely written um, kind of a memoir almost of his time working in hospitals with different patients and explaining how these uh, neurological and psychiatric disorders are related to how the brain works generally. Um, third, uh, I'm sorry, I have this long <laughs> list, but uh, uh, this book is um, on task by uh, David Better. And this is really about cognitive control and like the prefrontal cortex, executive functions. And what I like about this one is he is very, um, very specific. And um, I guess the word I'm looking for is something like, like uh, intricate. It, it, it feels like you're getting a really deep understanding of, of how these networks actually operate. And yep. um, and I think if, if you want to learn specifically about cognitive control, about how the brain kind of plans and working memory and a lot of the topics we've covered here, that is a great book. I also have an interview with David Better on my channel. Um, and okay. Can sorry. I jump in real quick, Andrew? Uh, yeah, go for uh, it. Because <laughs> this is, no, and this is like totally related. So we just had a, a question come in on the chat about what the future prospects for cognitive neuroscience is. That directly ties into this book. It's called The New Mind Readers by Russ Poldrack. Uh, Russ Poldrack is like one of the like leading thinkers in terms of like how to use MRI uh, efficiently. I mean, he's his lab has this big uh, consortium of sharing data and standardizing the way that we do MRI and everything. Um, and this book, The New Mind Readers, really gets into what the limitations are of what we're able to do with MRI. 
Uh, there's a lot of fanciful talking, especially I think there's been some some news reports that have gone out lately about Alex Huth's new studies where they're like reading people's minds. We've talked about that a little bit on the show before. Uh, but this gets into all of the, the kind of future ethical dilemmas that we're going to get into as we start to be able to really pick up on actual representations in people's brains, uh, be able to just by looking at their brain data, be able to say like, OK, what are the what are the words that this person is thinking? Uh, and with the new AI tools kind of in conjunction with MRI, there's a lot of possibilities there. But you have to realize future of cognitive neuroscience is still tied to MRI. It's still tied to this three and a half million dollar magnet that requires this like shielded room in this fancy university or whatever. Uh, and you have to put someone in this loud, this loud donut uh, and get them to engage in cognition to even be able to do any of this stuff. So I. Uh, if you're talking about like the future, that's going to be like technological advances that allow us to, to read brain activity in real time. And you can think about a lot of the like Elon Musk's wizard hat with Neuralink type stuff. Uh, I don't know how kind of widespread that stuff is going to be, uh, but the potentials for that are actually reading direct neural activity and then being able to eventually read the patterns of information in our brain to make sense of those representations and use them to cure paraplegia, to bring back senses, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff in that domain. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, I have to pick that one up. I haven't read that. <laughs> um, and uh, okay. And then we're going to get to the next question, but I just wanted to mention, I did ask a few different neuroscientists in the past what they're, what they would recommend as the one book uh, for someone to read about the brain. And um, uh, Dr. Gregory Hickok, who's um, really a pioneering scientist in the study of um, the kind of brain basis of language, uh, he, he actually recommended uh, Behave by Robert Sapolsky as well. Um, and, uh, and then the other one that I got a recommendation from was Dr. David Better, who wrote On Task, but his recommendation is a book called The Seven Sins, Seven Sins of Memory by Daniel Schachter. Schachter. That's a good one. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. So that's my very <laughs> long list of recommendations. And now we can move on to the next question. <laughs> that's good, though, because I, I mean, we, we touched the surface on a lot of this stuff. So if you really want a deep dive into how the brain works to give you context to fit something that we're talking about into a nice schema. Uh, it's going to require bringing some other stuff into the mix. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, the next question we got is, um, I'll just read it off here. <laughs> it is, is the triune model of the brain still helpful if inaccurate? It feels like we still talk a lot about cognitive control versus limbic emotions, et cetera. Should we still continue using this model when thinking about the mind? If not, how should we break down the major categories of brain areas? That's a great question. It is. Yeah. Do you want to kick this one off? Um, sure. Yeah. I, I guess we should just explain what the triune model yeah. of the brain is. Um, so this was proposed in the 1960s by the neuroscientist Paul McLean. And this, it, the basic idea is that there's sort of three um, levels of uh, in the brain, three sort of like functional um, levels that McLean sort of hypothesized uh, each evolved um, somewhat independently or at least came at different points in our evolution. So. Yep. At the the very base, the the bottom of the brain, that's sort of near the the uh, brainstem and the basal ganglia, he called that the reptilian complex, the reptilian brain. And you might hear people talk about the, the lizard brain or something, and that's <laughs> sort of referencing this idea. And then the second level up is um, the pale, paleo mammalian complex, is sometimes called, but it's a uh, more often referred to as the limbic system. And this was thought to sort of be where our emotions are produced. And this was thought to be unique to mammals, to um, to like all mammals. And then um, the next level up is the neocortex. So basically most of the cerebral cortex 
And this was thought to be unique to kind of, at least to social mammals, if not just to primates. Um, and okay, so is that, does that kind of align with your understanding of it, Taylor? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I think the, the thing that's really important to highlight here is how tempting this model was. Uh, so there's a great book by Joseph Ledoux that gets into kind of the evolutionary history of, of the brain and of consciousness. Uh, and he talks a lot about, uh, there goes Andrew again. Uh, no, he back. talks, a, okay, <laughs> talks a lot about uh, the triune model being a temptress that it really took fire in a lot of the, the neuroscience circles and the psychology circles. And it has a lot of intuitive appeal. I mean, it's it's pretty like standard language in the normal population to talk about our lizard brain and our emotional brain and all of these things. And I don't think that it's entirely inaccurate to talk about function in these ways. The big issue with the triune model is that he proposed an evolutionary path that doesn't exist in that the brain didn't evolve in these three separate steps where the lizards just had the hind brain and the brain stem and then mammals had this limbic thing that got put on top of it and then these higher order animals had this cortex that got put on it i uh, all over and i i personally so i have a video that i made uh two or three years ago where i I got kind of tempted by the triune model and I talk about it uh, as and before I really kind of did a deep dive into the evolutionary history. Uh, but the issue is that all vertebrates had all of these different brain regions all the way back to like the first vertebrates. The difference is that it's the size of these different regions that differs as the animals get more complex. So it's not that that reptiles didn't have these these limbic regions and these uh, these forebrain cortex regions. It's just that their behavior requires a lot simpler mechanisms. And so the regions that that govern uh, like homeostatic mechanisms and all of those kind of things are a lot bigger. Uh, and if you look, there's there's really interesting pictures. You can watch uh, some videos by Paul Chiswick, uh, C I S E K. Uh, he has this fantastic description and he's really, really good at walking through, but the different steps of evolution. Um, and it, he talks about it in terms of what he calls phylogenetic refinement, that we never really got new areas of the brain because genetically that's really hard to just all of a sudden create this new portion of our genetic code that all of a sudden creates this brand new brain region. Uh, what is more likely is that you had animals that were in certain circumstances that required behaviors that certain brain regions were better at. And so if you were constantly engaged in social activity and complex hunting patterns and uh, different foraging things, if you needed vision to determine different colors because of food and things like that, then those brain regions that already did that got bigger and more complex. And so it's not that the triune model is entirely incorrect in terms of its hierarchy, right? Because when you look, and this is something I think about a lot, um, I like to think about it in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that's what my video that I made this mistake, uh, I still like hold, it's still up because I, I like the, the message from it. Um, but it's the fact that you have to look at what these different levels of the brain are responsible for and the different kind of time scales that they're responsible for. If we're in danger, if we need water and food and those kind of things, then those lower brain regions that uh, have been kind of used for physiological things are going to have more control in that moment. They're going to have a, a, a kind of louder voice in those moments. Uh, and so it's not that we can still talk about limbic emotions and we can still talk about cognitive control because functionally that's what those different layers of the brain are doing. The problem is just that's not how it evolved. And so it's the triune model is more about the mistakes in evolution and not necessarily the mistakes in function, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, part of that is um, that there's this, there's also just anatomical overlap between all three areas or all three, I don't even, complexes, <laughs> I guess. Um, and, you know, there's connections from, from the cortex to all these different regions and there's bi-directional connections. Kind of the mm -hmm. brain is, is not like, you know, you have one uh, core region and then something that goes around that and another thing that goes on top of that. Uh, it's, um, it's really an integrated system. And uh, I think there was also one critique I've heard is that, with the um, 
the trying brain model, there was this idea that the flow of information was kind of always top down, especially in regarding behavior that the cortex sort of told limbic system what to do, which then told the, the, um, the brainstem or the, the, um, the uh, re reptilian brain to, <laughs> to do something. And that's just really not how it works. There's multi-directional um, yeah. flow of information between these layers. And um, yeah, just to kind of uh, drive that point home that Taylor was talking about where these other animals, these reptiles and um, invertebrates going back to fish, even they, they do have a cortex and even the, the lamprey, which is this just, um, the scientist Mark Humphreys, when I interviewed him, described it as just, it's almost just like a tube of toothpaste with teeth. <laughs> it's so simple, <laughs> such a simple uh, fish creature, but it does have a small strip of cortex. So it's really, yeah, it's not accurate to say that the cortex was just kind of slapped on at some point during mammalian evolution. And um, I have a video about uh, the evolution of the cerebral cortex and exactly what Taylor's saying. It's not that we got this whole new thing. It's that the cortical tissue already existed. And then it kind of, it expanded according to sort of uh, adaptations and evolutionary changes. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, everything you said, I, I totally agree with. No, and I, I think the one of the really important things is to think about like what each of these regions is doing, right? So you have your your brainstem is really important for physiological function. It's important for for maintaining homeostasis, for making sure you're breathing, for keeping your heart beating, and all of those kind of things. Uh, but then that's interacting with the the kind of midbrain regions where your amygdala is, uh, where kind of your hypothalamus that kicks hormones into gear, your pituitary, all of that kind of stuff that is interacting with how those physiological mechanisms should be operating in the moment, right? Because if there's a threat, we need to kick heart rate up. We need to divert resources away from the gut into the muscles and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so you have the middle regions are really responsible for like deciding how we need to change those physiological functions that are going on. And that's where, if you think about like emotion, emotion is usually coming from all of these signals from the body and all those things. Uh, but then the cortex is really, uh, I've heard, uh, I can't remember his, his name right now. Uh, he's a fantastic evolutionary biologist. And he talks about the cortex being the analyzers, that what they're really doing is they're, they're, re they're processing in high depth. They're, so you have these middle brain regions are kind of getting, uh, so imagine taking a picture on your, your 10 megapixel flip phone, right? And trying to say like, is that a bear? Uh, and your amygdala is like, yes, it's a bear. Uh, but then <laughs> it goes to the cortex and the cortex is like, all right, let's 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 refine this. Let's use our like 150 megapixel camera. And like, no, that's just a rock, right? And then that is like, oh, hey guys, no, it's not a bear, calm down, right? And so we can still think in terms of cognitive control, right? We have these regions that, that are really fast. The amygdala gets these signals a lot quicker than the cortex does. Joseph Ledoux talks about the slow road and the fast road is that evolutionarily, when you really think about it, it's important to make snap decisions, even if they might be wrong. Because if you don't make a snap decision and it is a bear, you're dead, right? But you now have this other layer that in humans has become really complex that is able to really make sense of the environment and say, okay. Uh, and I've heard, I've heard Andrew Huberman talk about like the frontal cortex being the like, shh, region right <laughs> it's it's like it's like we're, we're good we're good we've we've analyzed our goals we've analyzed all the all the stuff like it took us a while but we figured it out that's really great yeah yeah actually um and i think this this does kind of get into different theories of emotion and uh different how different scientists see what the data and and what these different brain regions are doing um like S someone like Lisa Feldman Barrett, uh, a constructivist, someone who's who believes in the con constructivist theory of emotion, uh, would say that this is completely wrong. This triune model of the brain has virtually no um, no value because uh, emotion and and um, feelings and these things that we're talking about are really whole brain phenomena. Um, but uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, we have a uh, episode where we talked about emotion and um, one about interoception. And I also have a video uh, recently about emotion as well. Um, 
But yeah, did you want to say anything more about the triune model specifically? No, I think I think the last thing that I want to say is that there's there's practicality to uh, simplifying these things into metaphors that people can understand to make meaningful changes in their life, right? If if I can understand that I have one region of my brain that's important for like cognitive control, right? For deciding whether or not I need to make a decision. And I have this other part of my brain that's really more about motivation and impulses and really quick snap decisions. And that there's an interaction between those two. And then down at the bottom is just like, I need to stay alive. That's not a terrible way of thinking about it. And it's helpful for people. And so if that really helps you to, to formulate these ideas and to realize how much control you actually have as an individual, then it's important to, to kind of feed into that a little bit, even if it's not entirely correct. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we, we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, I guess we can, maybe we'll, we'll try to get to those later in the episode or are there any yeah. that you want to try to tackle right now, Taylor? Uh, no, and I, I wanted to mention that too. So we, we, <laughs> when we do our episodes, we usually put a lot of research into these. And so we had a lot of questions that came in ahead of time. Uh, thank you all for putting questions in the chat. And it's definitely going to go on our list because we're going to be doing these at least once a month now. And so uh, there are some on here that I don't entirely know right now off the top of my back, off the top of my head. I uh, so I do know some stuff about AMPA and PAMS and M NMDA and glycine, but if I'm really going to answer that, I want to dig in more and see how it fits into the framework of what we're doing. Uh, and si same too with like uh, Asperger syndrome and autism and things like that. Those are really broad uh, ideas that we could spend kind of an entire episode digging into all of these different things. So I don't want to I don't want to touch these too much just on the surface level uh, because I want to be able to dig in if we if we can. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that this we will um if we don't get to these, we'll save these and try to get to them in a future episode or another AMA. Um okay, so question number 3 is um so it says is it true that glial cells control all neuron pathways and even make new ones and that they are the real living brain cells which are able to multiply and grow as needed? And they are the cells which hold all electrical charges while the neurons are just wires. That's a, I like this question. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one. And I, I remember I went to a talk in when I was an undergrad and it was someone that was studying astrocytes, studying glial cells. And I remember just being kind of like blown away because there's a very neuron centric kind of view of the brain that it's like, and I mean, at that point, I didn't realize that like glial cells like outnumber neurons. Like you think of the brain and it's just this, this mass of neurons that are all connected to one another. Uh, but there's a ton of cells in the brain that are all doing different functions. Uh, do you want to maybe walk through what some of the different ones are, Andrew? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like Taylor said, they are the most abundant cells in the brain. They, they do outnumber neurons. Um, and yeah, some of the most uh, famous ones are the, uh, um, there are astrocytes. <laughs> yep. And I'm going to step in because Andrew just disappeared again. <laughs> All right. So astrocytes are main ones that are kind of involved in, in blood flow and in maintaining kind of extracellular ion concentration and things like that. It's one that I'm going to talk about a bit here in a minute once Andrew gets back. Uh, but some of the other ones are, uh, so there's like endothelial cells that, that surround the ventricles and are really important for uh, producing and maintaining cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, some of the really important ones are allegra dendrocytes. And those are really important for wrapping the axons of neurons. And so they they actually coat the neurons with with myelin. And you can think of that kind of like the the rubber on the outside of, of a wire. It insulates it and it allows the, the signal to travel a lot more efficiently and a lot farther. Uh, and then there's also microglia, which are really small cells. They're, they're, they're uh, phagocytes, which means that they are kind of the cleanup cells in the brain. And so they're kind of eating up kind of uh, dead material and plaques and fibrotangles and uh, all of that kind of stuff. 
And you have to really think about glial cells as being the, the kind of helper cells in the brain. They're really the ones that are allowing the brain to do all of the fancy things that it does. Uh, and something that, and this is kind of a, a preview into our next episode, but I think it's really important to understand that all cells in our body communicate, right? Neurons are really good at communicating quickly and over long distances. And that's why they evolved to kind of be the way that they are is because we needed in kind of evolutionary terms, we needed, oh, it looks like Andrew's back. <laughs> Sorry, I see there's technical difficulties. I don't know. So, so I walked through astrocytes, uh, microglia, endothelial cells, and uh, uh, oligodendrocytes. Okay, nice. Um, sorry, getting back to it. Okay, yeah. So I think um, you say you, you talked about microglia or no? A little bit. I talked about them being phagocytes and kind of yeah. up. Yeah. yeah, they're like the immune cells of the central nervous mm -hmm. system. Um, and then uh, Schwann cells. I don't know if you mentioned those. No, I didn't okay. mention Schwann, Schwann cells. Okay, so yeah, uh, Schwann cells are actually in the peripheral nervous system. So in the kind of nerves outside of the brain, um, outside of the spinal cord. And uh, these are, th these actually really cool. They, they wrap around uh, nerves and they are, they serve at, or they actually help produce the myelin sheath that is important for uh, allowing neurons to more efficiently transduce a, a electrical current. Um, so uh, that and I mentioned, is I mentioned oligodendrocytes cell. being oligodendrocytes. similar to that. And so okay. their oligodendrocytes are in the brain, Schwann cells mm -hmm. are in the peripheral nervous system, so down in the body, but very similar function. Right. Okay, cool. And so do we talk about, we said astrocytes a little bit, um, some of the functions of astrocytes to get into that? Well. So astrocytes is what I really want to focus on, because I think that's maybe what the question is about, because astrocytes are really the ones that are very intimate with the neurons. And yeah. Do you maybe touch on, on some of the function and then I'll kind of get into some of the philosophical stuff. Sure. Um, yeah, there's one of their big jobs is kind of maintaining the blood brain barrier. So they help to form the blood brain barrier, which is um, kind of a layer between vascular tissue and um, like neural tissue. It's, it's, it's there because the brain, um, you don't want to just let everything that's in the bloodstream into the brain because there's plenty of toxins and stuff that could you know, affect uh, brain function. And uh, so this is a, a barrier that only, it's a selective um, semi-permeable membrane that kind of allows uh, only certain things into the brain, only certain types of molecules and nutrients. And uh, astrocytes are really important for helping to form that protective barrier. Um, they're also important in neurotransmitter uptake. So uh, astrocytes can... Um, sort of remove neurotransmitters from the synaptic cleft uh, to stop um, the term I'm looking for is um, it's the when neurons are excited to death and I can't think of, <laughs> of the term right now, um, but it's uh, basically excitotoxicity. That's what yeah. I'm looking for. When uh, there's too much glutamate in a synapse, which is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, uh, it can cause neurons to die because they're just being simply overexcited. And, um, and astrocytes are generally important for, for maintaining the sort of balance of neurotransmitters, as well as I believe, um, uh, ions like, like calcium in the synaptic mm -hmm. space or in the, sorry, the uh, extracellular space around neurons. And I think something that getting back to the question, uh, so there was, there's a part of this question about, you know, they're able to, to multiply, they're able to grow, they hold all the electrical charges. Uh, something that's, that's really important that I was kind of getting into a little bit when you, when you left was that all cells communicate to a certain extent. They all have ion channels. They're all communicating electrically. The, the really kind of powerful thing about neurons is they can do this over long distances and they can do it really quickly. And that's why kind of the neurons evolved is because we as really complex multicellular organisms require a lot of kind of figuring out how to balance the needs of different organs. 
right? Like the heart needs something, the liver needs something, the lungs need something. And then that's dependent on our external circumstances, whether there's threat, whether we're eating, whether we're doing this, right? And so there needed to be a way to coordinate that in a really quick manner and over really long distances. Because when I mentioned all cells communicate, all cells communicate over really short distances. They can communicate with each other, right? They're not able to send a synapse or send a uh, an action potential down an axon over a really long distance and communicate with a cell that's a vast biological distance away like a neuron can. Um, and so most cell communication is, is right there to your neighbors. And astrocytes are able to do that, but they're in direct communication with all of the neurons. Almost every single synapse has an astrocyte foot around it. And that astrocyte foot is making sure like, okay, do you got everything you need? Is there too much neurotransmitter in there? Like uh, they're communicating back and forth with the neuron. Uh, there's really cool stuff going on there. And one of the things that's really cool about astrocytes is it makes MRI possible because it is actually what is connected to the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And they are saying this neuron just fired. It needs to be replenished. And the only reason that MRI is possible is because we have localized blood flow, because we're not measuring electrical activity. We're measuring where blood goes after something was active. And the astrocytes are the ones that are controlling that whole process. They're like, look, these neurons just used a bunch of their resources. We need to bring blood just to them because we don't want to replenish everything. We don't want this just widespread blood going everywhere. We want to give resources to the things that were just active. So I think in terms of the question, the astrocytes are incredibly important. They are a really big source of, of maintaining and managing all of this communication. And I think the big thing that I want to get across is that we need to throw out this just neuron centric view of neuroscience, of the brain, of all of these kind of things, because we are a community of living cells. We have, we have muscle cells, we have bone cells, we have uh, liver cells and all of these different things, right? And they're all, they're all alive. They're all communicating with each other. They're all passing back and forth information. The only thing that's special about neurons is they can do that quickly over long distances. That's really, really good point. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the body and the brain are a community of cells of, of billions, hundreds of billions of cells <laughs> yeah. in the brain. And yeah, it would be crazy to say that neurons are the only are the only important cell in the brain. Um, it is, I think, important to note that that neurons are doing. I mean, it, it seems like neurons are doing a lot of the work when it comes to cognition and behavior. So I would say it's not quite quite accurate to say, um, as a questioner asks, that. Um, that they are the the real living brain cells um, because they're all living. Uh, they it is a good point that they're the only ones that actually multiply and divide because neurons don't generally do that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it, you need to have this holistic view, but then also understand. I think that it's it's fine to say that we should kind of understand that neurons are where a lot of the action is happening in terms of the actual computation happening in the brain. But then again, as Taylor says, like <laughs> all these other cells are contributing to that too. And even at the level of when we're talking about myelin, the fact that glial cells are what produce myelin, the brain would not be nearly as efficient in its communication. We wouldn't be able to send uh, these long distance uh, uh, signals from you know one part of the brain to another nearly as quickly without glial cells. So um, they they are indispensable, and uh, and we didn't even we didn't even cover you know half I think of the the variety of cells that are there. And I think there's you know still different subtypes that are being discovered. And this is just a super rich area of research. <laughs> so let's get into the next one, and I'll read this okay. one. So I. Uh, why can't we sleep for 24 or 48 or 72 hours continuously or even a day or six months? Is it just circadian rhythms? Or is there more to it? So uh, this one will we'll kind of go through quickly because it's uh, there. There is we need to be awake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. The, the most basic answer is like you need to eat and drink mm -hmm. at some point. Those are uh, really important physiological processes that uh, can't can't just be put off for six months at a time, but um, it is a good question. You know, why can't we sleep for 24 hours? Um, and 
I don't think it's impossible for a person to sleep for 24 hours, but it would be in, it would be like a, a pathological condition if that were the case. So why is that? Why can't we, why is it bad or, or unusual? I, I think, <laughs> I think a, a really good answer to this question is that, um, and this kind of ties into some philosophy, Gilles Deleuze is something I'm just going to get into in the next episode, but uh, is that our our body is kind of an, an access community that in order to get resources, you have to like work. So, and you can see this, like if you, if you're in, if you're incapacitated and you're laying in a bed for months at a time, your muscles atrophy, right? When you don't use cells, they stop getting resources. And so we, and it's, this is a, there's a really fascinating theory about like dreaming that David Eagleman put out. Uh, and it has to do with like regional takeover, right? So if someone, if someone goes blind, then the other regions of the brain start using that real estate to, to like hear better and to, to make sense of other things. They take it over. Right. And so there's, there's a constant, all of the cells in our body are constantly like fighting to prove that they belong kind of. And for dreaming, it was like we spend half of our life in darkness. And so the, the visual cortex had to prove that it was necessary. And so it just starts creating like all of these images at night when it's dark, even though you're not actually looking at anything. Yeah. And he, he talks about it as like the visual cortex is just kind of blasting like random <laughs> activity so that it doesn't lose its ner or its cortical real estate, which is a really interesting way of thinking about that. Um, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, I think, it, you know, physical needs and, and the fact that uh, brain tissue needs to be exercised to be maintained. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's about all I have. The best answer <laughs> I, I can actually, give to that. There's, there's a question that just came in that kind of ties into this that we can answer pretty quickly. But is meditation in a way just a marshmallow test for adults? In a sense, a practice of self-restraint that when repeated improves self-control. That's, that's another idea of what I just got into is that like, the more that you use these brain regions, the more energy they get, the more like influential they become. Uh, and meditating is kind of, yeah, you're sitting there doing nothing. Uh, and you're like, pro, you're, you're seeing kind of into the future, like what these benefits are into the future. And uh, yes, that is a very good way of thinking about it. That when you repeat it, you're giving that brain region more access, more resources and allowing it to have more control. Yeah, that's that is good, and uh, yeah, there's evidence that that the prefrontal cortex um, changes with with repeated meditation practice. Mm -hmm. um, Should okay. we get into the next one? Yeah, sure. So this one's kind of long. I'll read it. Uh, but this one was something that I was kind of uh, grappling with too. So we did a whole episode on learned helplessness. This one says, "I understand that stress activates the dorsal raphe nucleus, flooding the brain with serotonin and sending inhibitory projections to the paradoxical." Peri peri aqueductal gray and striatum this in turn affects motor control inhibiting movements dampening reflexes uh this phenomenon makes sense uh it's an outcome that keeps us safe when we can either fight or flee uh and it makes sense for a mouse to freeze in the presence of a bird uh but i think the big part of this question is uh that you know when we get a flood of, of serotonin, this learned helplessness research, uh, it gives rise to depressive symptoms. And a lot of the serotonin hypothesis uh, stuff about depression is about low serotonin. And so this question is like, okay, well, the dorsal raphe nucleus releases this flood of serotonin, but then everything in depression talks about low serotonin. So like, where is the where does the rubber meet the road with this and i didn't read the entire question i'm sorry it was kind of long uh but i think that's kind of the the idea of the question yeah yeah and it's a good question because you often hear that idea that low serotonin equals depression and that's just not really the case it's uh there's there's actually some research from 2022 that suggests that there's no correlation between low serotonin and depression when you look at at do a meta-analysis of all these data sets. But um, there is something to this idea because obviously increasing serotonin does seem to work for, for some depressed individuals uh, through using selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, but uh, the real, I think what answers this question, why is it that this activation of the dorsal raphe nuclei um, in, the ab or in the presence, in the context of stress, uh, can lead to this helplessness sort of 
depressive behaviors. Um, and it really, it, he actually touched on it in the beginning of his question saying, um, I understand that the dorsal raphe uh, sends inhibitory projections to the periaqueductal gray and striatum. And that's really the key. That is what yeah. um, the, the researchers, um, Stephen Mayer and his, his lab at the University of Colorado, what they've been working on is showing that the dorsal raphe, um, when when it's activated in the context of stress, sends inhibitory projections to these regions that the questioner mentioned, the striatum and the um, periaqueductal gray, and it also sends an excitatory projection to the amygdala. So the idea is it's more, it's not so much thinking about what is serotonin doing in the brain, but it's this particular circuitry that we're talking about, that when this is activated, um, it can increase uh, like feelings of anxiety, or, or at least that is sort of what is thought to be happening with the amygdala, and then also can inhibit um, sort of escape behaviors uh, reflexive escape behaviors via inhibiting the periaqueductal gray, and then also inhibiting um, the dorsal striatum, which has to do with motivated behavior. And so when you put all that together, you start to see, okay, th this does start to map on to um, learned helplessness. And um, yeah, I guess that, that would be my basic answer to that question. I think it's really important to think about depression in a very multifaceted way. I mean, there's people studying depression at very different levels of analysis. So one level of analysis is looking just at serotonin, right? And that's how the serotonin hypothesis got started, right? Is that we created these drugs before really knowing like what they did. Uh, and we saw, okay, when we stop the reuptake of serotonin, people's depressive symptoms are getting better. So that probably means that increasing serotonin decreases depression. And so that's it's got to be the case that low serotonin is what's causing depression. Uh, but then you have to like that's looking at it at a very molecular level. Right. But then you have to kind of take a step out. And you have to look at at regional differences, at functional and anatomical differences. Right. What are these actual brain regions doing? What are they connected to? Serotonin does something different in this brain region than it does in this brain region. Right. It's a very multifaceted, complex issue that uh, it, it's really hard to just simplify it down to a chemical imbalance. Um, and so much of it has to do also with the psychological side of these things, because learned helplessness is about psychological lack of control, right? And so there's this psychological representation that we're dealing with that's actually causing these releases of neurochemicals. And so we're in these very different spaces with all of this stuff. And so it, we can't just narrow it down to just serotonin or just this brain region or just the psychology. It's, it's all of it together. Yeah, and it's probably the case that there's there are subtypes of, of depression among different people. The fact that different mm. types of treatment work for different people, for different there's different severities of depression, there's different symptoms and um, uh, sort of uh, ways of diagnosing it. So I think that's another thing to keep in mind. It's really a, a complex thing, and and we're I think only beginning to understand the the neurological basis of depression. All right, let's go to this this next one. So we have, to what extent is it possible to improve brain function as an adult if you're really unhealthy, younger, food toxins, and lack of proper stimulation? Mm. That's it. This is one where I have to say I <laughs> am not an expert in in this kind of thing, and I don't want to sound like I I am uh, know this for certain. And this is also just I think an area of of research. It's kind of an active area. Um, but there's, you know, there's good reason to believe that it, it is possible to improve brain function, even if you were really healthy, when really unhealthy when you were younger. Um, but it would really depend on th the degree, like what we're talking about. I mean, if you were, you know, severely abused and neglected and you didn't have enough food and you lived in a really toxic environment and had no stimulation. I mean, I, I don't really know what the answer would be there, but for more kind of run of the mill cases, it's, it seems like people are incredibly adaptive, adaptable and able to um, improve brain function over time. 
Yeah. I, yeah. Really general answer there. Well, no. And I think that's, it's important to, I mean, we're not doctors. There's uh, very big differences in how to answer this question. And I think a lot of it depends on how much of this is biological and how much of this is psychological, right? Are we talking about actual damage to nerve tissue, right? So if you abuse methamphetamines for too long, you're actually killing and damaging the cells that are then responsible for dopamine release later. And at that point, there's no getting those cells back because neurons don't, I mean, some, we have some evidence that there is kind of neurogenesis in certain parts of the brain. For the most part, if you start losing nerve cells, it's really hard to get them back. But that's the other side of it. Something that we talk a lot about on this show is the power of neuroplasticity, right? And how hard it is, right? You, you can change, you can like, develop new values, new belief systems that psychologically set you down and do a different motivational path, right? And that does create different neural pathways that can change the way that you approach things and that you avoid things. Uh, but you really have to make the distinction about uh, what in this case is biological damage that would need some type of supplementation or some type of treatment for and what is more on the psychological side of these things that's more about representation and beliefs and and things that we have a lot of control over flexibly yeah yeah um okay should we we'll, we'll try to maybe keep zipping <laughs> through these as we go yeah we, yeah, yeah we have a, a good question or a couple um does overuse of areas cause them to overtake surrounding areas, even if they're both used? Um, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. And then, yeah, do you want to? I haven't seen any direct evidence for that. I have seen increased cortical thickness. Uh, so if you look at people that like play instruments, uh, you see, especially like with string instruments, you'll see increased cortical thickness for like the left hand that's constantly moving and pushing strings, but not on the, the other side where the other hand is just kind of moving a bow or plucking strings or something like that. Um, but if a brain region is being used, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to get taken over because it's already proving its worth, right? So what you're probably going to have is you're probably going to have proliferation and growth in that area that's doing that thing. Yeah. Um, and I like, I like this other question. I think we can answer it pretty easily, but what in your opinion is the most pervasive misconception in understanding how brains work that's still common, even among relatively educated people left and right brain differences. <laughs> uh, the right brain is not just this creative thing. The left brain is not just this analytical thing. Uh, it's not as simple as that. Uh, it's it's more about like the left and right brain are paying attention to different types of information. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there is some evidence that uh, left and, and right brain, um, the left and the right hemispheres are of different roles in emotion, like the left being more... Uh, activated more likely to be activated during positive emotions and mm -hmm. the right during negative emotions but yeah it's really complicated kind of goes back to our triune brain thing yeah. that whenever you try to just make these really simple di <laughs> anatomical divisions about oh this part of the brain does this and this does this it almost never works out that way yeah. um i think my my favorite uh myth is probably just that any one neurotransmitter does something like <laughs> yeah. people think that you know dopamine is the or serotonin are, are the happiness molecules or that um oxytocin is the love hormone or any any number of these things they just seem to stick around because it's really easy to want to take a chemical and say oh this does this <laughs> causes this kind of thing to happen and again you got to look at the brain as a really uh complex network of uh biochemical, electrical connections and cellular interactions. And um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a I think soup. The greatest, the greatest example of that is side effects, right? When you take a drug that's supposed to hit serotonin receptors and affect the way that serotonin works, it's also hitting a bunch of other cells that have serotonin receptors that serotonin does different things to, right? So like there's, there's a lot going on with these different things. That's a great point. So we have the next question was, does dopamine cause habituation, uh, i.e. while doing certain activities, for example, studying in a dopamine elevated state, make a habit of studying? Can use of amphetamines when studying habituate you to studying? <laughs> we don't condone methamphetamine use while you're studying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, this is another one where I think we're we're uh, getting a little bit like simplistic about what dopamine does. Uh, so mm -hmm. it it plays it definitely plays a role in reward and motivation and habit formation and habituation, as the questioner implies. Um, but to say that just raising dopamine levels will lead you to have a habit of whatever you're doing is not quite right. Um, do you want to say more about that, Taylor? Yeah. If you're taking methamphetamine, you're making a habit of taking methamphetamine. <laughs> uh, it, it's, I think your brain cares more about how great that felt than whatever you're doing while you're in that elevated state. Uh, because you have to think about what your brain is actually tagging as important predictor of reward, because that's what dopamine is essentially doing. Uh, and so unless you're spending a lot of time really convincing yourself that studying is important, uh, then all your brain is getting out of that moment is that drugs are good. <laughs> yeah, like you're not going to fool your brain into thinking that, you know, the the studying was what really produced that massive dopamine dump and not the, uh, the amphetamines that you were taking. Um, but there may be something there. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. say that like it's impossible. It, like, I guess studying in a dopamine elevated state could potentially reinforce the habit of studying. But it, yeah, like Taylor said, it's probably just more going to reinforce your taking of the amphetamines. But this this gets into, I mean, methamphetamines aside, this gets into intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Uh, we have some some great episodes on that about motivation, about dopamine. Uh, and a lot of it is about defining what the reward is. We are psychological creatures, right? We spend so much of our time in the psychological needs, not in the physiological needs, not in the safety needs. We spend a lot of time defining our goals in psychological terms. And it's all about kind of defining for ourselves, like what gives us purpose, what gives us pleasure, right? And that's what your brain is going to start to seek. That's what your brain is going to start to habituate towards. So if you, in terms of studying, if you spend a lot of time thinking about how important that material is for your future success as a person, right? And like this, this is what's going to allow me to be a good therapist or to be a good doctor or all, any of these things. That's going to habituate you to studying that material because you're, you're telling your body that there's a reward to doing this thing. That's yeah, that is the better way to go about it, I think. Um, and also just to note that like whenever you're taking a drug, uh, to raise neurotransmitter levels, there's always going to be this effect of tolerance and then dependence and possibly addiction. And then, you know, you're not just right back where you started, but actually in a worse place because now you're you're very highly dependent on this drug for, <laughs> for getting you to that uh, elevated dopamine state. So um, I like this, this next question is a good one. Uh, and it's it's kind of difficult to, to answer, but I think it's it's really important that we talk about some of the limitations here. So how does talk therapy affect the brain uh, and produce neurological changes? And she says, I remember a Sapolsky lecture where he discusses how it produces neurological changes, but doesn't go deeply into it. It'd be interesting to understand better. Um, the really, really important thing with this question is that I don't know of any studies where we put someone into a noisy donut MRI machine and had them do a therapy session while they were in there. And you have to think about the complexities with designing a study like that, right? Most studies that we do with an MRI require some consistency across the different subjects that we're doing because we're looking at large samples of people. So we need all of these people to be doing the same thing. If you stick someone in a scanner and have them do a therapy session and then stick someone else in the scanner and have them do a therapy session, you're different types of therapy, different people. There's really, it's really hard to make sense of what's actually happening because there's not really any control to the experiment, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Although I guess um, that you're right uh, that there's no studies that I know of either that are where you put someone in a scanner and, and then do the therapy session with them in there. But mm -hmm. there are, I think, sort of like before and after um, longitudinal studies that yeah. uh, have looked at things like mindfulness based stress reduction um, as and, and that this can change like the connectivity between prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Um, so there's there's some uh, interesting science there. And this, again, this is one that we could get into for an entire episode. And we only have one minute left in this <laughs> one. So. We can go, we can go a couple minutes over this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's, it is something that, uh, like Andrew said, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we're 
we're seeing correlative evidence for after the fact, right? So people have gone through therapy. We see neuronal changes. Meditation is a great example that came up earlier. I mean, we see increased cortical thickness on kind of the left DLPFC, which is involved in kind of planning, especially in kind of a safe environment. The left half of the brain tends to be more parasympathetic. So it's more about kind of feeling safe and feeling it in the moment. Uh, but a lot of the answers to this question are kind of speculative, but are based on other fields that we've talked a lot about in terms of belief change, in terms of the effects of positive affect on the brain, right? We have these entire episodes about what happiness does to the brain and just being positive and being in the moment about bringing gratitude into the moment um, is changing these, these neurological pathways that we even going back to the triune brain question is really about kind of increasing the pathways between these cognitive control regions and these regions that are maybe putting you more in a fight or flight mode, which a lot of therapy is about getting people out of fight or flight, that they're in these, these really heavily elevated stress. I mean, when you look at a depressed patient, they have tons of glucocorticoids in their blood, which means that they have, they're in a constant state of stress and their body is constantly kicking them into a fight or flight response, even though there's no actual threat out in the environment, they're creating these psychological threats. And so the talk therapy is allowing us to, to kind of reconceptualize these things, to develop the pathways between the regions of our brain that can understand abstract things with the ones that are more quick and kind of impulsive, right? So there's a lot of stuff that's probably going on, but it's it's speculative to say like, like we know exactly what it is because we haven't we haven't studied it. Yeah. And especially we, the two of us, haven't haven't studied it very deeply yeah. either. So, but yeah, that that's a that's a really great point. Um, so we are getting close to our time here. Is there any other questions you want to address, Taylor? Before I no, I think I I am blown away at how many questions we've gotten in the chat as we've gone through this, uh, and I, I feel really bad not being able to to cover them all. Uh, right now, uh, but we are going to save all of these questions uh, because we plan on doing one of these Ask Us Anything uh, episodes once a month because usually we do an episode every two weeks. So this allows us to kind of uh, do more. Uh, and this is this is awesome because there's really good ones in here that we haven't had a chance to get to and we're not ignoring you, I promise. Uh, we're so appreciative of the fact that we have a community that cares, that wants to ask us these things and wants to kind of keep tuning in and listening to what we're doing. Yeah, it's really amazing. Thank you guys for the, all these questions and this engagement in the chat. And uh, yeah, we're, I always look forward to these and, and we'll, we'll save these questions for the next AMA for sure. Um, but yeah, and then we'll also for the next one, put out more posts and, and try to, uh, if you guys have other questions, we'll try to uh, give more opportunities to, to uh, throw those in. And we have another episode coming up on Tuesday, and uh, it's an exciting one. It's our episode 20. We've been doing this for a long time, and we're going to get into kind of why my channel is called The Cellular Republic and talk about kind of the collective intelligence of cells and how to connect our mind and our body. It's going to be a really cool one, so I hope you guys can tune in. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. It kind of goes back to our very first episode. Uh, yep. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So yeah, thank you all for for watching, for engaging, for being here. Like Taylor said, we we just super appreciate this. This is really amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, keep the questions coming. Uh, we will do this more often. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to mispronounce your name. Uh, you, you uh, I'm sorry if I if I butchered that there. But, but thank, uh, you. thank you all for for uh, being here. Um, if you want to support us, um, we have this link right here in the upper left quadrant of the screen. Um, the <laughs> Patreon, if you go to patreon.com slash the social brain, uh, you can sign up and support us, support what we're doing because, um, yeah, they'll help, help keep the lights on, help us make more <laughs> episodes more often. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Awesome. Yep. And uh, I have some links on my page too. My wife runs kind of an Etsy shop and sells some like psychology and therapy inspired gifts and things like that. So uh, yeah, anything you can do to help. We we want to do this free for consumers. Like that's the whole point of doing this is getting this education out to people from behind these paywalls. Like if you try to look up a scientific research article, if you're not a member of a university, you can't even look at it. And that's ridiculous. I'm sorry, but that's so stupid because like taxpayer money is paying for this research. Right. And so that's why we want to do this. But uh, for us to continue to do this and spend the time, uh, we we have families and dogs that we have to <laughs> pay for. And uh, so we really appreciate all the support. Yeah. 
Definitely. And uh, make sure to like and subscribe to our channels. Yep. And uh, yeah, I guess we will see you next time.